Good afternoon everyone, uh, at least those of you tuned in east of the Nullarbor, good morning to all others. Uh, my name is Nick Khan, I'm a member of the Wine Communicators of Australia National Board and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar, the second for this year in the consumer perception stream we're running in partnership with the Grape and Wine Research and Development Corporation. This is just one part of the GWRDC's extension to industry around the range of consumer focused projects it is funding. And from a WCA perspective, it's a great way to get more good information out to wine businesses around the country. Our first session with the GWRDC looked at current consumer thinking about Chardonnay and proved a real conversation starter, both on the day and, and uh, subsequently. Today, Dr. Roberta Veal from the University of Adelaide will be talking about using live streaming to turn brand websites into virtual cellar doors. But first, to the logistics. If this is your first webinar, you'll be pleased to know that as long as you can see the presentation on your screen and hear my voice, you don't need to do any more. However, if you would like to ask a question or simply make a comment, and that's the beauty of, of webinars, there are three ways that you can do so, and they're up on the screen now. You can use the message box on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Just type and send a message as you would an email. It'll be visible to all webinar participants, and they can respond or add further comments. Or you can use Twitter, the address is on the screen, or you can email Jen Barwick, WCA's project manager who's sitting next to Roberta and me here in Adelaide, and we'll be collating all the questions and comments. Feel free to ask questions at any time, and we'll try to feed them through to Roberta at the appropriate time. But if we don't get your question, please don't worry. They'll be addressed in a subsequent blog. We'll send you out emails. Nothing you ask will be lost. We're, we really want to get hold of everybody's questions for today. And so, to our presenter. Dr. Roberta Beal is a senior lecturer in marketing in the University of Adelaide's Business School and she's the program director for the Wine Business Masters program. She's written extensively on consumer behaviour in relation to wine buying decisions. She works closely with industry and she's carried out projects for, among others, the Winemakers Federation of Australia and several wine regions. And she spoke at last year's WFA Outlook Conference in Melbourne. Over the past three years, she's been involved in an extensive project looking at virtual wine communities and other forms of e-based wine marketing strategies, and this will be the focus of today's presentation. So to kick things off, Roberta, perhaps you could provide the context to what we're talking about today. Thanks, Nick. Yep. Hello, everybody. Um, good to see so many people signed in. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is uh, the project that I was working on for the GWRDC and that was funded by them. But in order to set the scene, um, there's some information that I think is useful to understand or to think about um, before you're thinking about any sort of web-based engagement or your marketing strategy full stop. So the first thing I want to talk about is what brand engagement is and how that leads to brand attachment and why we care about that. Um, how consumers have changed, especially over the last 50 years, their new feelings of empowerment and what that actually means to marketers of all brands. Okay, got that back now. Um, and then uh, how you can uh, look at your own web presence and see perhaps what uh, you might do to enhance that and to leverage the possibilities that are out there. And then indeed, you know, very easily set up what can be termed a virtual seller door and build your own community of engaged consumers. So we'll talk a little bit about how you build that, what we know about how to do that, which is all really new ground specifically um, to this this kind of technology and uh, in the wine industry, of course. And then a little bit later about uh, what we found over three years of working um, extensively in this area and testing lots and lots of things, um, how to host meaningful events. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about a little bit is Today, um, what drives desirability, and I mean product desirability or brand desirability? And in the first instance, in the first instance, sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my slides here. Um, it's a good thing to remember that nobody buys um, products or services, and they never have. That's old news that was discovered in research years and years and years ago. What they really do is buy what a product can do for them. And so they're looking for the benefit. And benefits are real, but very often they're imagined. 
their um, intrin or extrinsic benefits or benefits that have nothing to do with the functionality of a product. And when we think about that, um, it's particularly important to think about that in relation to wine, which is a hedonistic product. It's something that um, is socially based and, dr and drank for pleasure, although um, you know, there's a lot said nowadays about how a glass of wine a day or so is, uh, is not exactly bad for you. So when people look at a product or a service, whether it's wine or a car or muesli, it doesn't really matter, what they see is a bundle of attributes. And some of these attributes provide specific benefits. And they look at these um, in a really holistic way. We don't ever look at a bottle of wine and only see the label or only see the closure or only see the variety or the brand. We look at it all. And uh, when we make our choice, we make a choice um, based on which one of, of the products or the choices that are before us we think give the best overall benefits and those benefits that are important to us. So it's, other, it's also important to realize that all products are made up of what we call intrinsic. So those are the things that actually affect product quality. So an intrinsic cue uh, for a car would be its engine size or its um, power or its fuel economy. Um, in for wine, it's the varietal, it's how it tastes, it's how much alcohol is there, it's what the bomé is, etc., etc. Um, but products are also made up of a bundle of what we call extrinsic cues. And extrinsic cues are anything that is related to the product that doesn't really affect in any way whatsoever its objective quality. And uh, whilst we, we, we intuitively know that only the intrinsic cues should matter, or that they should, should certainly matter the most. Um, so for example, for wine, how the wine tastes should be the most important thing when people are making a choice. But research shows consistently that it isn't. And uh, I've done my own research in this area where I've tainted wine with tartaric acid and uh, found that people really didn't give the taste of the wine more emphasis in their choice or quality evaluation than many of the extrinsic cues. So uh, in extrinsic cues that consistently, and this is universally, I've tested this in China and the States and Europe and Singapore and Australia numerous times, and, and not just me, many, many other researchers have also. The things that cue quality are price, the most powerful of all, brand, of course, Packaging, so this includes the closure, the shape of the bottle, all of those kinds of things. Country of origin, a region of origin. And for premium wine buyers, who are the people I'm the most interested in, it's any kind of insider info. So a referral or a lead from a friend or something that's special that they know that other people don't. So it's important to, to keep those things in mind later on when we talk about um, uh, the the value that can come from a streaming experience with your consumers. So um, what I want to do also is, uh, is just talk a little bit about price for a minute because I know uh, from working in the wine industry for a long time, people are very concerned about price. Price and margin are difficult to achieve these days and I've had numerous people say to me, Oh look, everybody just buys wine on price within a range or within a category. And um, you know, I guess that's true, but let's have a think about why that might be. Now this is a simplistic version of the three reasons that people buy on price, and of course there's permutations on this, but basically, in any product you can think about, there are three reasons why. First of all, it's an obvious one. They're demographically constrained or they've got no money. If they had more money, they would, spend, uh, they would spend it on better products or, or more higher quality products. And the minute that they do, that's exactly what they do. But many people are actually constrained by price, and so they buy everything based on that because they have limited money. The second reason, and this is very powerful, is that they actually have an attitude towards spending money. And they think of it, uh, they think of shopping as combat. So of course, um, in terms of achieving margin, we're not too interested in that group. But here's the group that uh, we work on in our marketing efforts. And this is uh, where people within a product or a range basically say, well, you know what, I see all of these things as the same. Um, and so I might as well buy the cheapest one 
because um, they're all pretty much the same. Now, I see that Sue's asked whether or not that extrinsic list was in order. Um, with price as the first extrinsic cue, um, yes, price is the most powerful of all. The others weren't necessarily in order. Um, that order can change depending on the segment of the customer. But those are always in the top, in the top five or six. So for some people it's country of origin, for some people it's brand, but those ones consistently show up, particularly with premium wine buyers, but price is always the top of the list. Roberta, it sounds like you're saying when we get into the virtual seller door concept, we're looking to appeal in new ways to an old set of values that essentially consumers have always been in a certain way, or are we dealing with a new style of consumer? Well, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more um, in terms of their empowerment, but um, if anything, what we're seeing is people um, uh, who have, are behaving in the same way they always have, but they feel more powerful. So what we want to do is avoid this situation of looking the same, but in a meaningful and desirable way. And so, you know, to think about that, we need to think about the empowered consumer of today. There was, you know, various eras. We've come through the sales era in the 60s and 70s. We've come through the consumerism era of the 90s and the early 2000s. Today, consumers are empowered. They believe that, um, that they're as clever as anybody selling anything. And so they're looking for a bit more than just promises. They're looking for a little bit more than, differ than differentiation. They're looking for opportunities to actually incorporate brands into their, uh, into their lives a little bit and to actually co-create and lead how products are actually developed on and offline. So what this means is, and uh, you know, we've seen it in responses to various social media campaigns and those sorts of things, that consumers today, when they are interested in a product category, be it wine or cars or tourism or whatever, then they, they can become very active in, in lending their own meaning to brands. Brand, brand managers don't get to just say what a brand means anymore. And I'll give you an example of that. Farmers unionize coffee. You know, there was, there's been chat many times about um, the fact that their carton and their branding looks quite old-fashioned, and I'm sure that there's many a marketing manager that would have dearly loved to upgrade that. They wouldn't dare, because that brand is owned by the people who drink it. Uh, Cooper's Beer is another example of that, where people feel very empowered. And uh, we've seen, whenever anybody, anybody ever tries to take over Cooper's, the consumers are the biggest advocates of that family. So what that means is, is that people are just not going to be sold to anymore. They've really grown up. And so the challenge is now to brand managers to grow up too and to understand that their consumers are their partners. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a lot of benefits to, uh, to you know, engaging with that. So we used to talk about loyalty. We don't talk about loyalty anymore. It's gone beyond that. Uh, loyalty was really a little bit of attitude, but repeat buying. What we're talking about now is brand attachment. And there's been chat, you know, in the research about, oh, you know, today consumers are not loyal anymore. That's rubbish. They absolutely are. Um, if you can get them on board, they'll even go further than that. Um, they identify even more strongly with brands that are important to them, that satisfy them, that give them satisfaction of not functional needs, but also emotional and social needs. And, you know, the latest research of the last 10 years ago um, has really identified how brands now become part of people's perceptions of self. So um, we become attached in both a cognitive and an emotional way. First of all, product, products must give functional satisfaction, of course, that, that's a given. But, you know, in this age of standardization, Many good, uh, many good products in a category will all provide functional satisfaction. Um, so that's an easy one in many ways to satisfy. But it's the emotional satisfaction and the social satisfaction where the real benefits of attachment for brands will be realized because it engenders an, an incredible level of trust and what you get is these advocates and you get your own customers spreading the word about you. And I mean, you know, brands like Harley-Davidson and Apple and, uh, you know, 
PubMed and many other brands that we can think of have been taking advantage of that for years. So one of the other reasons um, that we want to think about this a building of attachment with our customers is, and this is some research that I'm just embarking on now, what has been researched extensively is what an attached consumer can do for the brand, right? You get repeat buying and word of mouth, et cetera, et cetera. However, um, what's becoming pretty evident is that you know, consumers are not altruists. What's in it for them? And what we are living in today is an ever more stressful and busy environment cognitively. And so consumers have overloaded brains. Um, and attachment has become this welcome heuristic or, or cognitive shortcut when time is really the ultimate currency and choices are endless. You know, a person goes into Dan Murphy's, what do they see? Walls of wine, aisles after aisles of wine. And these decisions are stressful. It's much easier for them to say, I'm stopping at Dan Murphy's to get this brand, that's my brand, and you're in and out in five minutes. Whereas if you go in there thinking, oh gee, I'd just like a bottle of wine, where do you start? And um, you know, while choice overload is well documented in the, documented in the psychology and marketing literature, um, this, this has really gone be beyond that now, where the whole cognitive overload um, spills over in terms of our workload, our social life, our family load, etc. And so people who are attached I don't have to think about that. You know, I can share with you, I'm an absolute Apple tragic. Apple is my brand. If I need a computer, I only need to think about which Apple computer will I get, will I buy, not what brand will I buy. And I'm very happy about that because walking into the computer store, um, you know, does my head in. Consumer, oh, it's just choice overload, cognitive overload, um, you know, beyond what I really want to deal with. I want to spend my brain time thinking about other things. So attachment is a way for consumers to avoid that. But also, because they become so convinced that their brand is the best, they don't feel bad. There's no cognitive dissonance. They don't say, oh, look, I'm, I never say to myself, oh, gosh, I'm missing out on the latest Sony laptop. That never enters my mind, because I'm sure my brand's the best. Okay, so um, we have these attached uh, consumer-led groups, and you know, here's just a few um, examples of some brands down there, and um, you know, again, things that we have seen before. All right, uh, Steve's asked a question that brand uh, average brand is brand attached. Um, thought it would be more price attached. Well. Um, Again, there would be many different segments of consumers going into Dan Murphy's, and um, certainly that would be the, go to, the place to go to get a low price. So if you're just going in there saying, I'm looking for a Riesling, anything from Claire will do, uh, as an example, then yes, price would be the thing. But most customers would go in there um, with at least a short list of brands in mind because of the choice overload issue. It would just be too staggering to go in there with no idea whatsoever. Okay, so what do we get from this? What really, what does it mean if we, if we decide to go down this road? Well, first of all, you get customers who are repeat buyers and they have the right attitude about you, they give you word of mouth, they give you their purchases, or most of them. They'll defend you. You know, they'll come out to bat for you, which is an important thing. Um, and this is the best part, or one of the best parts, they are less price sensitive because they're convinced you're better for real or imagined um, reasons. And so you put your price up a little bit, that's okay. Um, unless part of your brand, uh, one of your brand pillars, of course, is low price, then, of course, they're going to be sensitive to price changes. However, they will still be less sensitive than unattached consumers. If you have a brand that's positioned higher than that, Raising your price, if anything, makes them feel even more special that they have an even better product because they're so convinced that price is a, is a leader of quality. Again, they give you word of mouth. However, they're going to give you word of mouth too. They're going to say things to you if you go down a road that they necessarily don't want you to go. Um, Club Med found out about this 
when they rebranded a few years ago. They decided to change their positioning and had an absolute revolt um, on behalf of loyal customers and they lost uh, a great many of them. Um, and one of the great things too, of course, is because they are a little locked into you, you don't need to convince them, so you get a lower cost per sale. And here's something that, again, uh, a brand like Harley Davidson has taken advantage of for the last 40 years or so. They are your own research panel. And if you think about what a Harley Davidson looks like today, many of them look a little bit like a lounge room. You know, they've got cooler bags, they've got you know, cushy seats, many of that, many reasons for that is because the Harley Davidson owner needs a lot of money and he's probably a bit older, or she's a bit older, but also because these are things that their riders said they wanted. Um, and certainly we see evidence of this uh, sometimes with products now where they're saying, you know, we've done this in reaction to you, we've learned from you, etc. But, you know, if you've got people in your community, you can ask them questions and they will tell you and you can uh, use that for lots of, lots of very good purposes. However, nothing's perfect. You have to cop that you will be criticized, and, um, and so you need to be ready for that. Um, you need to also be aware that uh, not everything that's said on the internet, although this is a statement of the obvious these days, especially on social media, it doesn't reflect reality. And very often there's nothing you can actually do to, um, to rebut that. Um, what you need then is just to hope that your defenders will come in and act on your behalf. Um, and you also have to give up a little bit of yourself. Um, but if you're willing to do that in a sensible way, then this can form a very, very strong bond. Um, I always give this example. My, my personal doctor is one of the Coopers. And I often chat to her about how she feels um, knowing that her own brand of beer is not really up to her family to, uh, um, to decide on when it comes to all strategies. And, and uh, they acknowledge that fully and embrace it, which of course is one of the reasons why they have such a devoted customer base. So what's different then about the project that I've been working on um, than what's been going on forever? I guess the most important, this is a critical difference that up until now, and this is really important, brands have always been left out of these conversations. Uh, brand communities have been set up by consumers, they're run by consumers. Sometimes brands are allowed to sponsor things, they're allowed to um, maybe be speakers at things, but they've never actually owned a successful community outright. I mean, brands own Facebook pages and stuff now, and there's some good feedback coming out of those. But in terms of leading uh, consumer-led groups, there's always been this skepticism that if a brand gets involved or owns it, what they'll really do, it'll be a thinly veiled attempt to just sell. And, in computer, and consumers have, have, uh, have said, no, this is private. So what we were uh, seeking to do would be to see you know, now that consumers have matured and brands have matured too, are they ready to have an adult relationship with each other, I guess, is one way to look at it. So, until now. Now, we go specifically now to uh, wine as a context. It's perfect. Um, oh, sorry, sorry about that. Um, consumer to consumer. C to C, sorry to use that jargon there. Um, C to C means consumer to consumer interaction. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, wine is a socially uh, oriented product anyway. People love to talk about wine. They come together often to drink wine together. So it's just a natural. It's a perfect context. Um, many consumers are highly involved. And so, you know, again, this is a, a good primer. Um, and uh, so again, it's a, a very easy context to, to test this on. And we know, we, we know from other research that lots of people have been involved in, and myself as well, is that a tourism experience or a visit to a cellar door or something like this or a wine region can be a catalyst to, um, to set up a, a, a community because people we know will buy wine again to go back and relive that experience. They have a great time somewhere, they want to relive it. 
Um, Roberta, Steve's asked a question, should we get involved in less positive comments in the C2C engagement? Um, it depends on how they're framed. If they're, if they're just sort of totter comments that are, you know, you'll find your, your advocates will come in and, and slap them down for you. If they're absolutely erroneous, um, then you should by all means correct an error. Um, you know, there's always two sides to that story, you know, whether or not coming in fuels the fire. But I'll, I'm a believer that if somebody says something that is actually incorrect, then, then you just need to correct it. Um, if it's something that's totally ridiculous, I would ignore it because somebody else will come in for you. Okay. So I just wanted to quickly show you um, this little model because um, this was a study that I was involved in a couple of years ago and we collected uh, data from some uh, wine festivals, one and two day festivals in the USA, Australia, France, Italy, I think they were all Spain, Austria, um, you name it. And uh, I collected the data uh, here in South Australia for the professor in Germany that was leading the study. And what it found was that this a particular wine tourism experience, people going to a cellar door or to a wine festival, they had a great time, they found it stimulating, that's what arousal means there, nothing more, sorry about that. And, um, and they, had it, they, they, satis they were satisfied. They had an expectation it was satisfied. So when those things led to a positive tourism experience, then they would blame the brands. And so that's what we mean by brand attribution. The brands were blamed for that. They, they went, they'd go, oh God, I went to the broth or I went to the hills, had a great time, oh, and I drank those wines there. It was the wine that led to the great time. And so that wine means good times to me. And that led to, as a result of that one experience, an, a change in brand attachment, specific regional attachment in this case. And um, the things that would moderate that, of course, was what was known about the brands and the places before the event. But irrespective, um, this is very powerful in terms of, of leading to a result that gives people a, a, a little foundation for doing something with the people that come and visit them later on if they decide to do so. So you're painting a, a very positive case for consumer engagement. I guess the question is, is it for everybody? Well, I think... Um, it is, because we're finding now that, again, margin is so under jeopardy for so many brands, and uh, online wine sales are offering a lot of brands heavily discounted, and that's not really where you want to be. Uh, you want people to buy your wine at the price that you would like them to. So whilst, of course, the business-to-business -business and the distributor relationships are critical, I realize that. Many brands are selling almost exclusively online or via cellar doors, and you want them to come to you because they think you're special. And so it's, it's, there's a lot of quite simple strategies that you can engage in to do that, and it can only be, it can only be beneficial. And I see you're about to tell us how to raise Yeah, the yeah, absolutely. So, so again, there's a little foundation work to do um, that I know you've been uh, learning about in other uh, webinars, so I won't go over it too much. But first of all, have you got your brand pillars sorted out? You know, do you know what your brand stands for? Um, can you elucidate quite clearly to consumers what makes you different? And it might be your stand on the environment. It might be your heritage. It could be your location. It could be other things that, that you do that aren't necessarily wine related. I like to use the example of Anita Roddick here she, at the body shop. She never sold makeup. She sold, she sold social responsibility and kindness to animals. And she, and she used makeup as the context. And she had very loyal customers as a result of that. She had a good product. You almost have, you must always have that. But you can make your brand distinctive based on more than just what's in the bottle. And, and I'm sure there's lots of opportunities. We saw it in the examples of people doing fascinating things um, as part of our streaming events that clearly supported their brand's distinctiveness. And then also, you know, do you have this marketing orientation towards the consumer? Um, and I want to make the point that that doesn't mean a big budget. Um, indeed, some of these strategies are really critical to the smaller brands who don't have deep pockets. You know, if you've got a, a big marketing budget, 
then you can use a lot of mass media. You can, you know, you've got the spend and the reach to be able to uh, make a big noise about yourself. But if you don't have that, then some of these strategies that are not expensive can be very powerful for you. So if the answer is yes, then this can work for you. Um, you'll be, you'll have to do some stuff though. You have to actively uh, listen and engage with your consumers. Um, seek their opinions and feedback, give them the opportunity to engage with each other um, as some of you are doing today as part of this webinar. That's, a big, that's a very important, the social satisfaction, because that, they have fun. You know, and again, when we think about a product like wine, you know, it's not muesli, it's not a health food product, although again, you know, a glass of wine isn't bad for you, um, but it is a fun product and people, they want to have fun with it and with each other. And again, uh, take their ideas on board and let them uh, co-create with you. And we've got some uh, we've got some good examples of that. Now, at this point, I just want to have a little bit of a bleat about uh, social media. Social media is a very useful tool. It really is. But I love this slide um, because I think what it does is put social media a little bit in its place. One of the things that I've observed. Um, over the last couple of years in particular, is uh, some wine brands believing that because so, and I think one of the things that's, that's a, a risk in social media is that it's quote free and that you don't need any skill to use it. Always be careful about things you get for nothing is my response to that. All of these brands are brands themselves. And um, they can be very helpful, very tricky in terms of supporting good foundation strategy. But the point I want to make is you need the foundation strategy and the brand strategy in the first place. Okay? So anyway, um, what is it about um, attachment online um, that we can do uh, to foster this? What are, you know, and have these co-created experience? Well, the first thing, um, that I think has been underestimated, and this came out really uh, unbelievably strongly in the researchers, is the degree to which consumers want to chat to the people who make their product. So every um, winery or, or most wine brands, they've got celebrities that are already on the payroll that are just ripe for exploitation in the, in the most positive way. And, uh, you know, if you think about that, that's why some cellar door experiences are so powerful. You know, I might be really attached to Apple, uh, but aside from the fact that jo um, Steve Jobs is no longer with us, uh, even when he was, I've got no chance of ever meeting him. I've got no chance of ever discussing my, my computer with him or what it is I like about his brand or asking questions about himself. That just doesn't happen. However, um, through something like these streaming events, consumers get this opportunity and they just can't believe it, like they just enjoy it so much to actually engage with the people who make this m magical, mystical product called wine. And they do think that it is, you know, um, especially to the premium wine buyers, something quite magical. So um, you get this opportunity for them to interact, for consumers to have their say, but the best part is these people are not paid endorsers, they're not celebrity endorsers that have been brought in on the payroll. They are the people who actually make the product and are involved in it, and so it's absolutely authentic. And that's what people are looking for, authenticity. People want to feel special, as I've said, particularly premium wine buyers. You know, it works well at a dinner party, and of course, it's an in-group experience something that the guy who walks into Dan Murphy's doesn't necessarily get to experience. You've got to be part of the group to have that come your way. Okay, I think you've, you've got us all on side. Okay. Let's talk about the live streaming, the project you did yep. with GWRDC, what came out of it, and I guess how the, the people involved in this webinar can get involved. Yep. Okay, so live streaming. First of all, the equipment is so simple. Um, a $7 microphone, a, a $20 or $25 um, webcam, and some um, free live media encoding software. And uh, I used an account with uh, some guys in Canada called Netro Media, who were like your Netro, they're your streaming guys, although um, at the university we're using Adobe all the way on this. Um, but anyway, 
very simple and um, all you need is a tripod, a camera and the account and you can be away. Um, and then the last thing is um, I opened up a Vimeo account for $99 a year and I can hold long videos up there and of course the link goes into your website. So the, the thing that I was really striving for and the team was striving for in this was to make sure I'm not a technical person at all and so one of the things was it had to be something that even I could do. So um, it wasn't difficult, pretty easy. So you can see uh, this is our setup. Um, in one of the PhD offices we had some backdrops from the Adelaide Hills and there's a couple of guys from up there talking about the sensory attributes of some wine. So, you know, a lot of creativity came out in these events. They had um, citrus and coffee and pepper and flowers and all those things in those glasses. People loved it. And then uh, you can see a Barossa HQ set up there. That's down the end of a hallway at the university. So uh, tables and some chairs stolen from reception. You can see the camera sitting there. And that's uh, one of my students just watching the streaming online. So that's all you need to do. But this is how it actually looks to people when they're tuned in. So you can see um, these guys here from Shield Estate. That was the setup, but online it looked really fantastic. And um, we learned that people should absolutely face right on into the camera. That was very important. And so uh, we did a short briefing with people on board, and, and these guys did a great job. This was sent to us by a participant from home. They were uh, tuning into a Bethany and Barossa cheese event. So they had a bottle of the Bethany there and some cheese and biscuits. And they're just sitting uh, at their table on their laptop. Um, here's the two guys that you saw set up for the uh, Adelaide Hills, which was our pilot uh, study going there. Um, again, the glasses showed all the sensory things that uh, could, be, could be experienced in their wines, and people enjoyed that. And then this is uh, us running the experiment. Um, this is, uh, oops, sorry, I don't know what's going on here. I have to come back a bit. So this is, uh, again, an example of what could be seen from people tuning in to our Adelaide Hills pilot. Um, you can see the comments going down the side. Jane Bromley is reading those comments on the computer and responding to them, a bit like I'm doing today. Um, and they were doing this really great event where they were showing how to make champagne. Um, now here's um, a little brand called Mount Sermon Wines from the Clare Valley. And we uh, rebranded them and set up their entire website. So this was the opening to their website. They have a fantastic uh, cellar door with an art gallery um, at the top of Mount Sermon. So their branding encompasses uh, the vintage, uh, uh, the vantage point and the beautiful views. And their community was called, called the Wine Lounge. Now they're not winemakers. But they do have a restaurant, and so what they did was they always involved a recipe with whatever wine they were highlighting, and they created something called a tasting pack for their, um, for their members. So people could order a tasting pack, and then they would come in for each of the events. Jenny, uh, this is Bert and Jenny Sermon, Jenny would put the menu or the recipe up online. People could cook along with them or see the recipe on the day. Um, and then uh, they would choose that recipe, obviously, to go with the wine that they were highlighting. And if you were a member of their community and you bought their tasting pack, you got a Mount Sermon apron to cook along with them. So you can see the, um, the comments down the side. Uh, Bert is busy reading the comments while Jenny cooks, and people just loved it. And then the videos were all captured on their website. They also put up teasing videos, like for example, they did a Yabby pasta, and so they put up videos of Bert um, catching the Yabbies beforehand and all sorts of things. Um, Barossa HQ was our most sophisticated site, the next best thing to being there. Um, so we learned that people wanted to see tasting notes, so we put those up. We saw that people wanted to, uh, some, you know, talking about co-creation, one of our members said they wanted a Twitter feed, so we put that up. And um, one, uh, one respondent said, oh, look, I wish we had a like button so that when people make a comment, we could like it. So the web guy said, no, 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 we'll, we'll have a wine glass and it'll be a cheers button, and then people can cheers a comment 
when they like it. And then we had cheerleaders, and people really love that. That's the Stuart Blackwell, and he's got a piece of 100-year-old uh, vine behind him there, and uh, James March from Barossa is uh, being compare there. And in, in each of these cases, Roberta, how did they go about publicising the session, getting people on board, and did they get the kind of numbers they expected, hoped for, and could cope with? Well, the thing you are, is what we found, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, was that um, what we wanted was to bring in specific um, people that were customers of these particular brands. And uh, what we had found, as we had found in the Adelaide Hills, was that people had mailing lists, but they didn't have engaged consumers. So many, many times, not for every brand, but many times we had to just recruit respondents on their behalf. So they would have lists of hundreds of people, but even when we were giving away their wine, they didn't come in. Hmm. So, um, can That's you, surprising. Um, it was, because, and I think it was most surprising to the brands because they thought people were getting their newsletters and really paying attention to them when we found that when those people came into the lab, because one of the things we got to do was interview those people in the lab, is that they go, oh yeah, I get that newsletter, but I don't really pay attention to it. I get dozens of those newsletters. Um, so, um, but, but there was some evolution of the community um, that was surprising, and I'll show you those results a little bit later. But certainly, um, we had fantastic results. So again, I just want to point to this little picture up here. These were uh, a couple who had come in as part of our recruitment drive. They, weren't, they were Barossa Valley wine drinkers, but not of any particular brand. And they enjoyed it and stayed on as real community members. And they used to have friends come around, and they sent us this picture from home one time of two of their friends that they invited around for an event. They had the wine, they were engaging, and um, they just did that. They, it, even though we didn't actually promote it, because it was research, it evolved anyway. Um, this was one email that we received. My uh, research assistant received this from somebody, again, that we'd recruited. And it it's, again shows the power of one event. The casting panel was a delight, but the event motivated this person to actually drive to the Barossa Valley to visit St. Hallett Winery and again, hopefully meet Stuart in person. Well, that didn't happen, of course, um, but they were still charmed, had a great time, um, and, sorry, most importantly, um, they're going to spread the good word. So again, word of mouth and action from, from one event. So, you know, pretty powerful. Um, these are, again, just some uh, feedback notes from people who did. We had people um, create, uh, complete a survey prior to the event telling us what they felt about Mount Sermon or Barossa wines before. Then we let about two weeks go by. Then we tested them again to look for a change in their attitude. And we also asked them for lots of feedback. And so we got some great feedback even though it's really a new concept. So a lot of our respondents weren't sure what to expect. Um, so again, you know, they say there, this last chat says, from the email I got, I didn't understand it was going to be an online meeting. Uh, really surprised, but still, it was an excellent experience and one that they'd be happy to do before. So as a researcher, we were very happy about that. Um, a little bit of Facebook support. Um, which we thought was fantastic. This was from our um, Adelaide Hills uh, pilot study. So, you know, perhaps it's better than watching some mindless TV because, again, you start running these events, they're really low cost, and what you've got is your own closed circuit TV program, really. The, you, you talked earlier about the tools being fairly simple and, yep. and low cost, and yet some of the online stuff I'm looking at looks reasonably sophisticated or certainly very attractive. The Mount Sermon, obviously, yep. a small winery. Was there a lot of work for them involved, and I guess they had the advantage of working with you and your yep. team. Would it have been harder for them if they were just out on their own, and the next Mount Sermon wanting to take this on? Um, well, I guess this is where I'm going to, because it's, um, you know, we're constrained by time here. When I say about getting your brand sorted before you start, mm -hmm. and getting, and I'll talk a little bit about what makes a good website, but we did need to rebrand Mount Sermon, because they, and we did that using professional people. And so uh, the rebranding exercise using, uh, in this case it was voice, 
design here in Adelaide mm -hmm. uh, was about $5,000. So you can get a rebranding between five and 7000 depending on exactly what you, you're looking to achieve. And then, of course, they, they really didn't have a proper website, so we had to do the website from scratch. But the actual, the actual community aspect of it is about $7,000. We used, again, an Adelaide supplier called Triple Zero. So, you know, you do have to have that foundation before you can look at this strategy that uses the foundation. Okay. Okay? But, I mean, I do other presentations just talking about branding, but there wasn't time to cover that today. Okay. Sorry, I'll get back to where I was now. Okay. So here we go. Um, I want to, uh, first of all, don't be too worried about these numbers on here, but I want to just go through exactly what, um, what this means, this model. And the, first of all, the important thing is this brand ambassador. We had originally thought that the influence of the brand ambassador would actually moderate um, what had happened between the three types of, of satisfaction that people get from these events. So people in a community, we know that in any sort of brand community, people are looking for cognitive satisfaction, so they want good information, right? They want to learn about their product, how to use it better, how to get more out of it, what's new, etc. They want social satisfaction. It's a community, right? It's like going down to the pub used to be. So they want to chat with each other and have a social um, interchange. And they want some kind of emotional satisfaction. They want to be stimulated and they want to have fun. So what we thought was that the brand ambassador would influence those types of satisfaction on how people, how engaging people would find the experience. Now, here's the important thing. We found that it drives it. It actually drives it. It is the ultimate uh, independent variable. And so when people loved the brand ambassador, and they mostly did, that person provided the knowledge, you know, stimulated the social exchange, and people had fun talking to this person. And I have to say, we had very few presenters that people didn't like. And it's because they all had the main criteria. They were knowledgeable, they were down to earth, they were engaging. Um, where we had negative feedback, we only had it early on. It's where we had, an, we had a couple of examples where uh, winemakers, when there was two of them or, or even two people on board, engaged in what we call the winemaking bromance, <laughs> where uh, they would just get so involved in their favorite topic, wine, and the wine that they make, that they actually, in one, in one case, it was horrific, put their shoulders and their back to the camera. People were incensed absolutely incensed, and they got hammered. But well, that's why we said, right, and we can't have that happen. You've got to look straight down the barrel. You've got to answer people's questions. Um, uh, you know, you've got to really bring them in. And Steve asked a good question. What's an ideal length for a session such as this? About an hour. We, ran, we found that, and when, they, when people were really onto it, like they were treating the winemaker like a rock star, and that happened a lot, we just let it go for an extra 10 or 15. If the questions were still coming, we'd let it roll. But about, about 50 to 60 minutes is ideal. OK, so then they drive the satisfaction. So what these numbers are saying up there is, is, um, is this basically what you have is 11% um, of cognitive satisfaction. So while people might say, oh, look, it's all about um, it's all about learning. Well, it's more about the emotion, actually, which is worth twice as much. So, again, people want to learn, but they want to have the social exchange, which was about as important as the knowledge exchange, but it's really about them having a good time and feeling special. And so what that has is this incredible effect of like a 71% effect on uniqueness. And then that has um, such a strong effect on their level of attachment. Now, what you're seeing here, I want to be clear on this because it's important, is the change. Now, when we run the model on the level of attachment, it's way higher. But that's not accurate in terms of what, of what the cause and effect of the event is. That one, because remember, we measured their attachment to, to the wines 
beforehand, then we stimulated them with the event, then we measured it after. And so what we're seeing is a significant change after from one event. And then that flows on to a huge change in word of mouth and um, a small but significant change in the willingness to pay a premium price. So for example, um, their willingness to pay for a bottle of Barossa wine went, um, went up almost $3, $3 a bottle. So before them, we ask, what does a decent bottle of, of uh, Barossa wine cost? And you can see the good work done here by the Barossa Valley. I've tested this many, many times. Uh, around Australia, people think that a decent bottle of wine costs about 20 bucks. Not for something special, not just for the barbecue, but a decent bottle is about 20 bucks. People think a bottle of Barossa wine is worth $7 more, so on your Barossa. Um, uh, but it, it went before the event from 28.68 to 31.42 on average. Significant. Um, Jeremy's asked what sort of numbers were you getting attending these events ah. and, are, and are numbers important in their own right? Um, no, not particularly. I mean, we, we, this was a semi-controlled experiment, so we were recruiting people. Um, and sadly, we were recruiting them because few of the brands had enough people of their own that would come, right. which I think is pretty amazing. Part of the issue. Part of the issue, and there, therein lies the issue. I mean, we were knocking them back for a couple of brands, but most people, as I said, they said, oh, look, we've got six or 700, or we've got 300, and we couldn't get 10 responses. Right? So we were recruiting people. So we would have up to 10 or 12, although we would have more than that signed in. Um, and so uh, you know, as your community grows, then of course numbers organically grow with it. We did have people signing in from the States, from, from England, from, from all sorts of places. Now the other, other, thing, um, other uh, point I'd like to make here is that um, neither the Barossa nor Mount Sermon, aside from the work that we were doing to get respondents, were promoting their community at all. And we still ended up with 350 enroll enrollments in the community at the end of the project when we wound it up, and 90 for Mount Sermon, which um, is pretty good going, I think, for the few months that it actually ran in each, in each area. Right. We've only got a few minutes to go, and then yeah. we'll move on to getting people, how to get people yeah. to join in. I'll just make the point for people that the, the final report of the project, Wine is a Social Bond, is available yeah. on the GWRDC uh, website. Yes. Yeah. Or we'll, sorry, will be uh, quite soon, or we'll let you know when it is there. Um, we had a question also which you may not be able to answer in a short period. Any suggestions for people who live in areas with not pretty good internet coverage? Obviously what you're doing here requires a pretty stable, strong line. It's always best, although for Mount Sermon we streamed with a, uh, a GPS modem and we, we had pretty good results most of the time. A little bit of lag, but um, so it did work. It did work in Mount Sermon. Were people willing to wear a bit of lag? Were they were they into the, the event? And they yeah. sometimes you get annoyed. You've logged on yeah. to something, and the minute it drops out, you give up. But uh, in in something like this, you seem to be suggesting it's a it's a community engagement, and you accept that sometimes things drop out. Yeah. Well, we would say that. Bert would say that. He'd go in and say, "Look, if we if you lose us, we'll be back." And only on a couple of nights when the weather was really horrific, there was storms that we had no luck whatsoever. But mostly it went pretty well. So first of all, again, um, communities take time. They're an organic thing. But there's things that you, um, you know, again, that you need to have in place beforehand. So, and it comes down to what makes you special because that's going to drive your event. Um, you need to activate your inactive club or emailing list. Um, and start communicating effectively. So, you know, again, this is what I was mentioning before. Many of our brands were shocked at the reactions to specials because we often, and this is logical, we'd offer, offer a special with the event and we got low responses. Um, so many lists were found to be just that, harvested names and email addresses, but, you know, again, when we spoke to people in the lab, they go, oh, yeah, I get emails from them all the time, along with a, a dozen others. So um, it's about planning, really. Think about events that support your brand values and your competitive advantage and your distinctiveness. Don't think that these need to be complex or difficult. They don't. It's about the sincerity and the authenticity. So I mean, the guys from Shadow Tananda brought in core samples of their soil and then discussed how that made the wines taste different 
in the different you know, brands that they had on offer. Stuart Blackwell brought in his stump, and we had winery dogs. We've had people, met, you know, the Brom, Bromley and Hilton, Mc, uh, Jane Bromley and Hilton McLean making champagne, and people just had a lot of fun. And don't worry if things go wrong; that's part of it. Uh, we've, you know, things happen all the time. It's the interaction that people are looking for. Um, we find that two wines works well. Wine and food is a winner. Uh, we had uh, the girls from the Brossa Valley, O'Leary Walker and Tash and Other Delights. They did a nice event with cheese, so that all worked. Uh, that all worked very well. Um, and you know, people will ask their own questions, um, and we got people talk about things that aren't related to wine as well, and so they just want this insider knowledge. Um, so again, uh, referring to your own brand distinctiveness, your own personalities, you know, the, the sermons were unbelievable. That you know, People said, wow, you had that kind of elderly couple involved in this cutting edge technology. They were fantastic. Bruce, Bruce used to swear a bit and they always kissed Jenny at the end and stuff got knocked over, but everybody, everybody liked it. It was very much about them. So think about you and that informs the content of your events. As I said, we had winery docks, bits of old rootstock, soils, recipes, teaser videos, uh, small fry wine and the Barossa, uh, their cellar doors and old bank. Um, so he did a really great video about the building, which is a heritage building. People thought it was fascinating. Um, you may consider an update of your current site. So uh, thinking about now and the currency of today, which is time, and the benefits that people are looking for, um, clarity, ease of navigation. One of the things, I didn't show any moderating variables on that model, but one of the things that uh, did bring a couple of the sites undone is that if people didn't find the community site easy to get around, that was a killer. Okay, and it's the same for your site. So we've kind of moved through a lot of flash and a lot of stuff. You know, no clutter is good, less is usually more. Now that doesn't mean that you don't have interesting things. By all means, have videos, have links to your Facebook site, have, if people have the time and want to, things they can do. But when they just want your phone number, or if they just want to order a bottle of wine, or if they just want to know when your cellar doors open, make sure they can see that easily. Um, and again, if you're looking to sell wine online, make sure that's easy, or otherwise let people know where they can get your wine. All the current, in, all your info must be current and up to date. Before we started this project, I did a content analysis of 250 wine sites across Australia. We were astounded at how many wine sites didn't even have current phone numbers, or addresses, or links that were active. So again, what, did, what does this say about you? People say, right, so you know, they're maybe not so careful or they're not so professional or whatever. And remember also to, to keep your brand integrity. So if you've got a logo or if you've got a look or if you've got a style, it should never break. You know, the term, the term we use in marketing is a broken brand. And again, um, there's some good examples and bad examples of that. We've got about a minute, Roberta. Um, okay. Final steps that people should take. Yep. So here you go. Um, there's uh, nothing too stressful about any of these things. Um, uh, the equipment? Yeah, yep. you can set all of those things up. So plan your calendar events and send it out. Think about, you know, one event a month is fine. Middle of the week is good. Make sure that your members are special, so they should get some sort of special deal. It might be a premium or something like this. Um, get all your email documents and other media ready. You know, my research assistant and I had everything um, up to date and ready. We had a, a kit, and no matter who was presenting, that kit rolled out. And review your email listing, as we said. So you should launch your community, and then um, just promote it again in everything you do. So links back and forth to Facebook pages, links to video on your website, remember it in any of your print advertising, um, pamphlets at your cellar door, leaflets in your wine packs, um, whatever you're doing you should always let people know that this is happening. Terrific. Roberta, thank you. Um, a terrific presentation. I think a re obviously a really interesting piece of research. Um, uh, I'm sure the GWRDC will be pleased with the outcome. As I said, the report will be up on the GWRDC website very soon. Um, 
And of course, please go to the WCA website to see the blog in relation to this. Any questions that weren't answered, we will get back to you either on the blog or via email. Um, can I remind you of our next webinar? Please, if you enjoyed today, if you've enjoyed any of the others, please tell other people. We think the webinar concept is great for the wine industry. Uh, GWADC is involved, the Winemakers Federation is involved in some of the other sessions. Tell people about it and get them involved. Our next webinar is with another new partner, ASVO, looking at who's running wine shows, the future of Australian wine shows, a, a constant topic. If you read any form of social media in this industry, you, you read all about that. Uh, this will be free again to everybody uh, in conjunction with the ASVO. Um, you can find information on our website. Registrations aren't open yet, but they will be very soon. Um, and to conclude, um, can we ask you to uh, complete the survey, um, our exit survey if you've got the time, look at the blog, look at the video, get in touch with Jen Barwick if you've got any questions. And um, thanks again to uh, Roberta, Dr. Roberta Beale from the University of Adelaide um, for the project and to the GWRDC for funding it. And we look forward to talking to you at our next webinar. Thanks. Thanks.